Welcome to Meet the Author, where you can join in on insightful conversations with best-selling and award-winning indie published authors. Your hosts today are Rob and Joan, who themselves are indie published authors, book publicists, and paranormal investigators with Tampa Bay Spirits, based in Tampa Bay, Florida. Thanks for dropping by. And now, on with the show. Hi, I'm Rob. And I'm Joan. We're glad that you're here, whether you're listening and watching us live or listening and watching us not live. <laughs> We're so happy to be here. We want to remind you again today that is a pre-recorded show. Even though you're watching it live, it's still pre-recorded. <laughs> and we miss your questions and comments. As always, like, follow, share. We have a great show for you today. Yes, we do. And just a reminder, we have a store now, right? <laughs> yeah. And one of our new uh, items, newer items uh, that we have in the store, one of many uh, new designs is Keep On Reading. And it's kind of designed after the Keep On Trucking from the 60s, but uh, a little more hip, I think, than that. But at any rate, uh, drop by the store uh, at IndieBookSource.com and uh, check out all the reading-themed items that we have there. Um, tonight, we want to welcome uh, Lisa Sherwood Fabre, um, multi genre author, but uh, she's got a lot of interesting uh, work to talk about. So, we're going to bring her in uh, right now. Hello, Lisa. Hi. 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 How are you? Good. We're really good, Lisa. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. How's the Tampa Bay? How's the, the weather there? We're finally. Finally, getting some cool weather. Finally. Oh, <laughs> it's been we above average. We have a lot of rain. Oh, not rain. We have a lot of wind today. We do Yesterday also. And today. We yeah. do too, and it mm -hmm. isn't going to barely make eighty today. We're so. yeah, which is really cool which for us. Which is cool. <laughs> <laughs> Need a jacket. I I wore <laughs> jeans out today when we took our walk, which I haven't done in a long time. I Where live in Texas, live? so I know. Oh, I, Texas, I live okay. in North Texas, yeah. So I know, I know hot. <laughs> there you go. You know, yeah. humid, but I know hot. <laughs> there you go. Uh -huh. There you go. Uh, yep. Yeah. And there's our dog. There's our dog uh -huh. piping up there, making herself known. <laughs> I know. I would like to ask you a question. Sure. When, how did you get interested in writing, and was it your first thing that you did, or did you have another career, and then you decided to oh, write, or? Sure. Well, um, I always knew I was destined to be a writer when I was in the second grade and got an A plus on a short a story I wrote about Dick Jane and Sally's ruined picnic. I always I've always enjoyed writing. I can remember in high school even um, the Scholastic magazine. I'm sure you probably remember those from your days. Scholastic Magazine used to have a, a student writing contest, and I would enter. Even though there wasn't, I hadn't written any anything for school, I would still enter. Um, I never won, and I learned a lot about word count back then. I had no idea what word count was, but I may, had my little sister count every word in, in my story. I didn't know that and you could basically estimate the words by knowing that it, 250 words to a typewritten page. Yes. My, 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 <laughs> my little sister, she was so good. She counted out 10 words and Aww. made a mark, counted out 10 Aww. words and made a mark. And I'd add them up, all, uh, all those 10, wor uh, 10 word pieces together. God bless her. <laughs> um, I, I have a PhD in sociology and I worked for um, more than 30 years with the federal government. I worked in a couple of different agencies. I worked at Health and Human Services. I worked at uh, the Census Bureau. I, I worked at uh, um, the Foreign Assistance Arm of the U.S. government, which is the Agency for International Development, and got to live in a few different countries. And when we were living in Mexico, um, I was... Um, I, I got a copy of um, Isaac Asimov's magazine. And that was the first time I'd really written anything in years since probably high school or college. 
And I thought, I read some and I thought, I, I have a story. I have an idea for a story. And I sat down and wrote out, uh, typed out a story. And back then you didn't even, we really didn't have computers like we have nowadays. I had a little Apple that uh, my husband had gotten because it was a little more portable than those big uh, IBM computers. And I mean, you had to, you had to save it on a, on a floppy disk. There wasn't even, you know, there was no memory in those computers. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I wrote it and I sent it off and almost immediately got a rejection. But, and that was okay. I, it taught me a couple of things. One is I needed to study more about what I was doing. And um, that I, and, but even more important, I learned that I could do it. I could write a story. And I had young children at that point. So we would get home, I would put them to bed, and then I would write um, after they were in bed. And uh, so I, I learned a lot from that. Um, and then my husband uh, took a, was given an assignment. He's an international consultant, and he was given an assignment in Russia. This was shortly after the fall of the Soviet Union. And so I joined him in Russia, and that was, uh, we were there for five years, and that was where I really um, started writing seriously. Um, I had, um, I finished one novel, and I started a second based on something that I heard about in Russia. Interesting. And, yeah, it was um, that the Iranians were recruiting Russian scientists who had been, who had lost their jobs with the fall of the Soviet Union. And they um, were recruiting these scientists. And I, th and I wanted to figure out how scientists, uh, how, why a scientist would accept a position like that. So I created an unemployed microbiologist who had a sick daughter. And that's the basis for saving hope. That's okay. wonderful. That's yeah. really fascinating. Now, where did you live specifically in Russia? Moscow. Moscow. And mm -hmm. when you lived in Mexico? Uh, Mexico City. And my <laughs> husband is actually Mexican. Uh, oh. We met on a blind date uh, in 77. So <laughs> we've known each other for quite a number of years. <laughs> we've been married more than 40. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I lived in Mexico. Uh, oh, really? Mm -hmm, in Guadalajara. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we've been there, but uh, didn't get the, uh, never, uh, well, we, I, in particular, I remember Guanajuato. We went to Guanajuato. We went on, on a trip once and we went to Guanajuato and we went to Guadalajara. His, um, he had a, an aunt. Well, actually, it's a great aunt, a great aunt who were twins that lived in Guadalajara. Yeah. I lived so, there in the yeah. late 60s, early, early 70s. Uh huh. I had two children that went to the American school there. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's a, there's a, I know that there's a large American enclave there. Oh, um, oh yes. A lot of yeah. retired people. There's, yeah. um, which I wasn't retired uh -huh. back in the sixties, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is may, I'm ancient now, but I would be really ancient <laughs> if I was yeah. retired then. But, um, yeah, there's a huge enclave of Americans and also Canadians and also Cubans who wanted to get into the United States at that time mm. and, and couldn't. So they, they went to Mexico instead. Yeah. Now, were you around, I think it's called, it's Lake Chapala that's there? Uh, uh, no, I know where Lake oh. Ch Chapala is. I lived okay. in a part of uh, Guadalajara called Chapalita, uh -huh. but it was just, you know, that was just the name of the, the neighborhood. But I remember when the, um, the Cubans that lived a couple of houses down from me, the Cuban family, lovely people, they were so excited when the Americans landed on the moon that they had a huge party. Oh, and, wow. Um, I was the guest of honor because I was the American. <laughs> they were congratulating me, me like it was something I had done. And I was like, <laughs> oh, how, how it was nice. difficult, but you it did was, it somehow. <laughs> it was really very nice. Very lovely yeah. people. Everybody there uh -huh. was super happy. 
I don't imagine that if you had lived in Russia at that time, everybody would have been super happy oh, with congratulating no, no. you. <laughs> 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 that no. was pre-fall <laughs> yeah, of yeah. Russia. <laughs> yeah. By a, quite a few years, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 But that's that's really interesting. And mm -hmm. um, well, that gives you a really great background for writing yeah. stories. Yeah. However, I just want to bring this up because I happen to love Sherlock Holmes. Who doesn't oh, love wow. Sherlock Holmes? And for you to be writing those books to me is like just brilliant. And the, you wrote this one, Life and Times of Sherlock Holmes. Mm -hmm. That's that's fabulous. Did you have to do a lot of research for that? Well, this these are actually, I'll tell you how these books came about. Um, my goal, I actually was working on a, a, a fiction series. Um, the, the whole series is called The Early Case Files of Sherlock Holmes. I was on the treadmill one day working out while I was at my office, uh, well, you know, just my government job. And um, I used my office, my lunch hour to, to work out. And I was working out and I started thinking, how did Sherlock Holmes become Sherlock Holmes? Because there's very little information in the original books, uh, which are referred to by Sherlockians as the canon. Yes. And, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and they, uh, I decided, and I started thinking, well, you know, the the typical answer would be something like his father, something about his father uh, training him or something. And I thought, what if it was his mother? What if his mother was, we know that Sherlock Holmes was, uh, had a, a, an incredible intelligence and very logical. And we know that his brother, Mycroft, might have even had a higher one, except that he was he wasn't one to go out and, and chase criminals or anything. He he would have thought about it and said, "This is the guy," but he would not have chased after him if the guy took off, at, um, left the room, or whatever. And so, I thought, well, what if it was his mother, and she has the just as she, her her intellect is just as brilliant as the as her son's, and but. As a woman, she wouldn't have been able to do the kinds of things that men could do at that time. And it would have been difficult for her to go out and investigate crimes. So what if she taught her children to do it? Brilliant. Well, and so that's where this series comes from. We hmm. start off with Sherlock Holmes at age 13. And his mother was, a, um, was is accused of murdering the village midwife. And he's got to solve the crime before she hangs. Is it yeah. this book? The yes. Uh -huh. The Murdered Midwife? Yes. Uh -huh. Brilliant. That's wonderful. But to write that book requires a lot of research into Victorian times. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, and, and since he's 13, we're talking about um, 1860. I have to do the math right. 1867, because uh, Sherlockians believe that there's a reference in, in one of the books that Sherlock, uh, that he was, I think he was, I can't remember what age that they, he said he was. And if you do the math, that meant he was born in 1950, not 19, 1854. Okay. And okay. so um, he would have been, to be at 13, he would have been, it would that would have been 1867. So uh, you, I pulled the clues that I could find from the original canon. There aren't a great deal, but he says his ancestors were country squires, and we know that his um, he had a brother named Mycroft. And there's a reference that his um, that suggests that his father's name was Seeger, S-I-G-E-R, and. Uh, we don't have any clue. Uh, oh, and that his grandmother was the sister of Vernet. And Vernet is a French portraitist. That's He makes a reference to having art in his blood. And so with those clues, um, you can learn, a, you can figure out a lot. But I needed to do a lot of research, like what in the world was a country squire and things like that. And so I started the research and 
I thought, you know, this a lot of this research would be good for other people as well. There are mm-hmm. other people that would be interested in in Victorian times and Sherlock Holmes. Right. And so I and the Sherlockians are extremely organized. I don't are you familiar with the Baker Street ir- irregulars? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> This is, uh, that's the mothership. That's the, <laughs> the organization that um, was formed in the 1940s. Uh-huh. And then there are local chapters or scions uh, throughout the country and the world. And they can be recognized by the Baker Street Irregulars, the, the main um, organization. And so I started writing to all the, the scions that I could find that had newsletters, because one of the things I thought is I, I, I've been in other organizations. And to me, the, one of the things that's always difficult is um, finding content for your newsletter. Sometimes, you know, you have to beg somebody, please write an article of right, write something up. Um, And so I thought, what if I hand handed them each month a, a short essay about something about the Victorian times that's mentioned in in one in the canon, and so that was I, I wrote to a, a a number of them, and uh, at one point a few of them have uh, gone by the wayside for different reasons, but um, I had like I had, they go all over the world. I send out an essay each month. Uh, but not everybody is in a scion. Not everybody gets a newsletter. So I decided, well, I'm going to put these essays together in, into little books. And they are little They're, because my essays aren't very long. They're between 500 to 800 words, just a few pages. And, and so is that this, this is one. This is the first volume. And then and, and, this and then you have two more volumes. Two and three. Yeah. The, okay. Yeah. The blue one also includes an article that I wrote for um, the Baker Street Journal, which is the Baker Street Irregulars um, um, journal or of official publication. And, <coughs> and that one is on um, the villainesses uh, in the canon. There Wonderful. are fourteen women. There are fourteen women, and I do an, in, an examination of what kinds of villains, uh, villainesses they were. So and that's included that, in the blue one. Was that well received? I mean, did they love all those essays? I bet they did. I'm sure um, they did. I still. I mean, I'm still selling. Yeah. I mean, the people, the newsletters are very happy to get them. Um, <laughs> and um, I tried to. You know, I'm a sociologist. I have a PhD in sociology. I don't do, I, I try not to do shoddy research. I try to do, you know, they're all footnoted and, um, and I try to, um, and I try to show a little bit of humor as well. Um, yeah. I love research so, that has citations. I love it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but I like to do research too. It so valid, when I read a book that has, so much, yes. You know? Yeah. Yep. Well, I, I do believe I, and I try the, I'll have to admit uh, originally I did a lot of Wikipedia, the first couple of essays. I quit that. <laughs> yeah, that Go ahead can... and get a drink of water. <laughs> yeah. We will wait. I do that when I talk a lot too, Lisa. So, what, yeah. well, Wikipedia? I've got, no. I told you about oh. all the, I told you all about all the, the wind. It stirred up a lot of dust and yep. pollen and everything. It does so. yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's terrible, isn't it? Well, that's really fascinating. I mean, that's that's really I love that. So when we when you did this, the adventure of the murdered midwife, we find Sherlock is now 13 years old. His mother is accused of murder, and he has to find out who actually murdered the midwife. We yeah. know he's brilliant. So we see him for the first time actually using that great brain of his. Yeah. <laughs> with, to... with some, <coughs> excuse me. Sure. With some direction from his mother where possible. I'm sure a lot of direction from his mother. He was only 13, though. Most 13 year olds think that they're old enough to do just about anything. And 
where did you set that? Where in the country? Because he was from a uh, I just, choir. I, I'll be honest. Uh -huh. I don't know. <laughs> okay. So it was just generalized. Over there somewhere. Just in yeah. the country. Okay. Someplace okay. far enough that you have to take a train to get to London. All right. So, there you go. Okay. okay. <laughs> Good. Good. Um, I And my greatest fear is getting it wrong. Yeah. So. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, I would that. say it's in the southern part of the country, but I. Yeah. Probably not very far east. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Not very far anyway. <laughs> well, okay. So then that brings us to, nope, that's your third book, right? No, that's the second. That's second. That is the second. Okay. Yeah. The Adventure of the Murdered Gypsy, Gypsy. How old is he now in this book? He's still 13, but he turns 14 at the end of the book. This one takes place okay. in, at Christmas. Okay. <coughs> so it takes, awesome. it takes us a year to read it? No. <laughs> oh. <coughs> that's really yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. um, and, then, and this one is a few months later, in, in spring holiday in London. So he's still 14. Uh, and uh, in this one, uh, somebody that Mycroft knows um, floats to shore on the Thames during just after the Oxford Cambridge Cambridge boat race, which wow. happens to occur. Over and the spring holidays, we'll assume the person was dead, not <laughs> yes, not yes. just floating. Okay, no, no, All he right. was dead. <laughs> and um, a, there's a there's a concern that it's a suicide. Now, he is um, a nobleman, and if he were to be, if according to what I've read, uh. When if a nobleman commit well anybody who commits suicide, the gov all assets return to the government or return to the, to the, um, to the tr the government treasury, and it's supposed to be a deterrent for um, suicide victims, but it could leave the family destitute. And yeah. so the sister is his sister is very concerned that the family is going to be left destitute. So she goes to the Holmes family and she says, if you don't um, help me prove that this is a murder, I'm going to ruin Mycroft's reputation. Oh. And so. A little bit she, of blackmail um, there. <laughs> and so they have just, and they have only a few days before the coroner's inquest to make sure that it's a, a murder. That's. That's really well thought out. I really like that. <clears throat> and I'm sure that Sherlock Holmes fans would love it too, because I love all of the um, stories that have been written about Sherlock that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle never wrote. You yeah. know, about, I especially like it when Mycroft is involved. <laughs> I like the way people have played upon that relationship and the way that they picture it and, and talk about it. I, it, I really like it. Yeah. Well, with a seven year age difference, you mm -hmm. know, Mycroft is Sherlock is 13. Mycroft is 20. Right. Exactly. Um, so I make Mycroft, you know, view, you know, he's not, he's not above calling his brother a twit. Right. Or, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Which is what a lot of this, yeah. <laughs> the the books have portrayed them as having a, a contentious relationship. Yeah. At but the same time, love underneath. Yeah. Yep. At this, time, there's love underneath. That's that's what I like about it. It's mm -hmm. really really awesome. That's good. Yeah. Why don't we break for commercial? All right. Give you a chance okay. to rest your throat a little bit. Yeah. Maybe take um, a few more drinks, and yeah. uh, we'll, we'll come see back. See what I and can do. <laughs> three, three, <laughs> three or four <laughs> minutes um there will be a book giveaway after the commercial so so stay uh, tuned everybody people. stay tuned and see you in a couple minutes okay hey look at us we've got a new store yeah we do <laughs> it's pretty exciting what can you find there? <laughs> we have a number of designs available on t-shirts hoodies coffee mugs laptop and phone cases pillows and new designs are coming in all the time sounds like a great place to shop for authors and readers yeah and it's easy to find it's simple just 
Visit IndieBookSource.com, click on the Store tab, and you're there. Many secrets are hidden within the darkness of the jungle. Behold, this one about a man, a woman, a black jaguar, and an ancient Maya legend. Two Faces of the Jaguar is a novel by George Dismukes that will take you deep into the jungle and capture your imagination until the last word. Two Faces of the Jaguar is book one of a trilogy. Two Faces of the Jaguar, where only the adventurous dare to read. Two Faces of the Jaguar, The Lost City, and The Jaguar's Quest are available on Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, and many other bookseller websites. Two Faces of the Jaguar, the book people are talking about. Get your copy today. At Indie Book Source, you can shop by genre or by author, and you will be buying direct from the author's main purchase link. We offer hundreds of titles in formats that include ebooks, paperback, hardbound, and audiobook. Support an indie author. Visit IndieBookSource.com today. WLFE Digital Broadcast Network presents Variety Unlimited Television. Watch shows like Meet the Author Podcast, The Bipolar DM, Just Cindy, Card Pulls and Coffee, Unfiltered Talk with Bryce, and more. That's right, our shows are your shows on WLFE Digital Broadcast Network. And now, back to the show. Welcome back. Welcome back. <laughs> I'll see how my... Th uh cough does now <laughs> okay well let's let's talk about your book giveaway first here okay get that out of the way the first three people to email lisa at lisa sherwood fabre.com will win an ebook copy of the adventure of the murdered midwife yes and we just heard what that book was about mm -hmm. it sounds fascinating and anyone that loves sherlock holmes and who doesn't love sherlock holmes i mean I love Seriously. it. Seriously. <laughs> where else can we we'll want it? Where else can uh, the audience find Lisa? Oh, that was a good <laughs> really good. All right. Here's some places that where you can reach Lisa. Her website is www.lisasherwoodfabre.com. That's www.liesesherwoodfabre.com. Now, I'm not going to spell it out for you guys, so pay attention. <laughs> Facebook is lisa.sherwoodfabre. And her Twitter is an easy handle. It's at lsfabre. And her email you just heard, but we'll repeat it again. It's Lisa at Lisa Sherwood Fabre.com. And go there now if you want to win the, a copy of that book. And also that you can sign up for my newsletter and you get um, a uh, free cop, uh, a free short story. Excellent. Called. Great. Sounds like a win-win. Yeah. yeah. And if you like me, if you follow me on BookBub and let me know, there's another Sherlock Holmes short story duet that's only available for those who follow me on BookBub. Oh, you just have to let me know. <coughs> that's Unfortunately, really BookBub does not give me their your email address, or fortunately, probably for that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, if you'll uh, follow me on BookBub and then email me, I'll send you uh, a short story duet. Oh, that's very nice. That's a really good thing. And I'm sure people will be interested in doing that. Yeah, I hope so. Is that bookbub.com? Uh, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I, I just put in bookbub and it goes there. Yeah, so. Google it. Google it. There you Google go. it. You'll find it. <laughs> it's there. It's there. So you want to tell us about what you're working on now? Is there anything coming down the pike that people can look forward to? 
Yes, yes. I have a uh, book four or a case four of the Sherlock Holmes series coming out. Um, it's been, uh, it's, I've gotten comments back from editors and I need to, and I need to get that finished, uh, some uh, additional work done on it, but I'm, it'll be out in 2020, 2022. Um, I'm not sure when I, but shortly. Good. And, uh, in 2022, it takes place in Paris. Interesting. The, the well, the Holmes family goes to visit their French relatives, the Vernays, uh, there in Paris, and we find out that his and the the connection to the Vernays is through his mother. His mother is Violette, and she. The, we've learned that there's she had quite a past in Paris. She, oh. uh, yeah, as far as a Victorian woman goes, she was quite ra uh, racy, <laughs> but you know, that's France, right? So mm -hmm. if we know the French, everybody's <laughs> racy in France. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that we, we can forgive her for that. <laughs> yes. Yes. And, um, and it's called, uh, the adventure of the purloined portrait. Oh, I love that title. <laughs> well, that's good, right? And, I think um, using purloined in a title is always an excellent <laughs> yeah, choice. It's, yeah, it's kind of, and you got to work it in right. So, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. there's a reason why it's the purloined portrait and why it connects up with the Rene family. And yeah, people who know Sherlock Holmes will get yeah. that. Oh, yeah. We, uh, they get to visit the Louvre and they, um, it, uh, I, there was an awful lot of research that I had to do for this one as well. Finding out about Paris in 1868 was uh, quite a, quite a, I was very lucky there. I actually found a guide for English um, tourists to Paris in 1868, believe it what? or not, an 1868 guide <laughs> to Paris. Wow. Uh, so now, that did you made it a little bit easier. Now you lived in a lot of different places. Did you uh -huh. live in Paris for a while too? No, I haven't lived in Paris. I visited. Okay. In fact, that was the last place we went before COVID. Okay. We were there oh. just, um, oh gosh, it would have been January. Uh, I mean, I wow. was sitting, I, I would watch the, um, the news <clears throat> on my iPad at night. And, um, I, you know, there were these, these things going on about some virus in China and right. you know, people and, and, um, but I had no idea what that meant for all of us. Right. Um, yeah. It's yeah. insane to think about how, how much, much the world, the shifted. world. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and you're lucky you got back when you did. <clears throat> oh you yeah. Well, it was, it was before, you know, thanks. Um, lockdown was in March. Yeah, not until so, March, yeah, but still, yeah, yeah. that was yeah. pretty close. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of people got uh, stuck. But while we were there, there were they were having a um, public transportation driver strike. The bus drivers oh. were on strike, wow. and we actually couldn't get back to our. We had an Airbnb mm -hmm. apartment, um, and we couldn't get. We were on one side of um, a demonstration, and we couldn't get to our apartment because the the demonstrators were marching down the street between us and the apartment. Oh man! Um, so we wound up sitting in a bistro for several hours, uh, oh, waiting, for, <laughs> <laughs> waiting for the demonstrators to make it all the way through. And the the police were all in riot gear. And every once in a oh. while, one would come in and use the restroom. And <laughs> the, oh in my the goodness! Bistro. It was very it was very interesting. Yes, um, yes, especially. Right? Sociologically speaking, I'm sure yeah. you found it really interesting. Yeah. You were living the life, seeing yeah, it, there it was. <laughs> not as a tourist, but yeah. real life. Yeah. Did you get to see Notre Dame? Were um, you able to go from into the it outside? At all? Just for, I, I, yeah. I could see, I have pictures of the scaffolding. Yeah. But that wasn't the first time I'd been to Paris. So I'd been to Notre Dame before. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Um, it's, it was, I'm glad that they were able to, um, 
to stop it. I'm glad that they're able to, uh, at some point they're going to be able to restore it completely. I think. Right. You know, right. Uh, it would have been a loss, a true loss. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah I remember it, I think the whole world stopped and just watched. Yeah. It was horrifying to see such an iconic yeah. Yeah. piece of history to be on fire like that. Yeah. Just, just horrible. It was heartbreaking, really. Yes. yes. Because it was beautiful. Yes. And had so much artwork in it. it oh, just, yes just incredible but i understood they got a lot out i i hadn't heard that but that's good to know yeah yeah, yeah. i heard that they got a lot out that they, i mean people were you know running in and saving things and risking their lives to get all this wow yeah. this stuff out yeah but i understand why you know yeah firemen are firemen everywhere <laughs> <laughs> they're all heroes <laughs> yes they are they are well, that is really interesting. That's really fascinating. Um, I don't, it's funny to think about pre COVID because everything has changed so much yeah. now. It's like we, we have a little dog, as some of you may have heard her barking a little while ago. And she, we had to take her into the emergency vet around five o'clock this morning. She had, a, uh, she was in a great deal of pain and, uh, we had to call three different emergency veterinarians before we were able hmm. to get into one. And the veterinarian that we saw said that they're having trouble staffing. Hmm. Then a lot of veterinary clinics have shut down because they can't, they can't staff because of COVID. And I said, because of COVID? And she said, I know it sounds weird, but she said, I think it's because of all the stress that people are going through hmm. that, mm -hmm. that, uh, the veterinarians, if they're women, are staying home with their children, and and if the techs are, are women, they're staying home with their children. There's you're, we're seeing a lot of of that happening hmm. around the country. So, yeah. yeah, I just I can't wrap my mind around about how much it's changed. Yeah, yeah. So and many. Yeah, I think it's to gonna be. I think it's gonna be a different world. I think we're going to all. Everybody is going to talk about. Pre-COVID and post-COVID, my my husband one day was saying, you know, you talk about the millennials or you talk about the baby boomers, and what do you think this generation is? And I said, COVID. He says, Oh yeah, <laughs> that's a, COVID generation. You know, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's awful. <laughs> well, but I, I mean, it's going to define it. It defines so much about um, their life, their world. Uh, yeah. When you think about school. Um, uh, my husband keeps saying, I don't understand this thing about um, the, the concern about kids not being able, not learning as much because the, uh, learning remotely and things like that. He says, that's the way I like the, like it the best. And I said, well, I, I can understand you, but I'm watching our grandchildren and, um, <laughs> <laughs> and I, she, I had a, a granddaughter who was sick and was taking some course uh, doing school remotely for or like about a week and um not just her i mean i i was like standing over her making sure that she would was paying attention and stuff but there was this one the teacher was saying to somebody else who was on uh, remote saying you know you've got to turn back on your uh turn your video back on if you don't turn your video back on i'm going to have to mark you absent um, because I don't know that you're paying attention. Uh, I could see some kids that seem to thrive that way. Some of them, you know, answered the question, the teacher would ask a question and they would answer it and everything, but not my granddaughter. And I love her dearly, but that was, <laughs> I could tell that there was, she was not, she's not one for remote learning. She really needs to have that, um, personal interaction. Yeah. She, she wasn't engaged. Online. Yeah. Uh-uh. Yeah. Yeah. No. That's that's interesting. Yeah. We homeschooled our two youngest children. We have six. We homeschooled oh, our wow. two youngest and almost all of our grandchildren. And we have 14 of them were homeschooled mm -hmm. and, you know, and have gone on to college and everything like that. So it didn't affect any of <clears throat> our grandchildren mm -hmm. at all. But we have plenty of friends with children and grandchildren that 
it did affect well, and quite. It, it did affect some of our grandchildren with their extracurricular oh, yeah. mm -hmm. activities yeah. that they had, like, you know, uh, karate and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. They yeah. couldn't do that anymore. So their friendship and bonds have all changed and have, have, yeah, I been, think it's, have suffered from it. It's going to be yeah. really hard for all of the yeah. kids that, uh, during yeah. this time, I think. And I don't think everyone is... Um, can learn the same way. There are many yeah. different learning types. When I yeah. first started yeah. homeschooling, we happened to live in California, and there's a, uh, they call her the grandmother now. <laughs> she used to be the mother of homeschooling, Kathy Duffy. And um, I happened to be in the same group as her, so I got to, to learn from her and found out there are four different types of teachers, the way they communicate, and four different types of learners, the way they receive that communication. And, you know, it's it's fascinating because you have to teach to that student. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. sometimes in, in, a, in, in a classroom situation, some kids are going to get left out of that. So I can see where it would benefit some children to be homeschooled and benefit other children to be, like you said, your granddaughter needs to be engaged, needs to be engaged with that that person and maybe even needs to be engaged with the students around her, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. depending on the type of learner that she is, that that would be a benefit to that person. Yeah. So it's in, it's interesting. The whole COVID thing is interesting. Yeah. And I wonder what kind of books we're going to be seeing <clears throat> coming from it. It'll be interesting to see that too. Cause be. yeah, we're, we'll hear, well, <laughs> there will be books about it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Are yeah, I think to... um, I think it's going to be a while. People are, you know, we're still in it. Oh, oh yeah. And, um, oh yeah. It hasn't yeah. gone away. Yeah. yeah, it's we're too much in it to write about it. Yeah. right now, except and actually, all of our angst. And actually, the um, the Russian book Saving Hope it actually deals with bioweapons. Does um, it? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, she's a microbiologist, and the Iranians want her to develop. Um, a um, vaccine okay uh, against uh, uh, what another um, a bioweapon um, here's the book that yeah. Lisa is speaking about mm -hmm. saving and health. she's willing to consider going to Iran and working on the bioweapons pr program that they have there because of her daughter who is sick her daughter is hope Nadezhda Oh, my and goodness. So saving Hope is, um, and she stumbles on this, uh, onto um, a plan to export a bioweapon to Iran. And that's, that's where she comes, uh, that's where she has to decide, am I going to save my daughter or the world? Wow. So, so was that, did you wow. say that was your first book? Yeah, that was the first published. It wasn't the first one I wrote. The one, okay. the first one I wrote is under my bed. Well, metaphorically, <laughs> it's not. We don't do that anymore, you know. But <laughs> actually, that one actually was printed out and sent out to people. You know, that's how long I've been trying, uh, working on this, um, in this career, uh, that I actually used to have to mail out manuscripts. Yeah. And, oh, I uh, remember yeah. that. <laughs> Speaking. I still, I was going through something and I found, I had, still have some manuscript boxes that I had bought sometime <laughs> that, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do with them now. They're not, <laughs> nobody needs it. Nobody they're, ships They're it. artifacts. Uh, <laughs> maybe that's what I should do. I was thinking as you were speaking that my one grandmother, um, my Irish grandmother, well, well, never mind. One of my Irish grandmothers, <laughs> um, Lillian Donovan was born in 1854. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. I was like, so oh. She probably knew. She probably did. She probably yeah. did. She <laughs> may, may have shared beds in the hospital together. <laughs> there you go, or something like that. <laughs> <Yeah. She, laughs> well, she was Irish, but and he was British. But I thought, well, mm -hmm. that's crazy. That's, that's yeah. pretty interesting. And yeah. I often think about how much times have changed since my grandparents were born and what they lived through, the, all of my grandparents lived through the Spanish flu and um, never talked about it. 
They talked about the Great Depression, never talked about the Spanish flu. And now that we're going through COVID, I'm thinking, why the heck didn't they ever talk about that? I mean, that must have been horrifying. They went through the same thing that we're going through now. They had to wear masks and everything. Yeah. I think the difference was, or I think some of the differences are, that the Spanish flu really didn't attack um, normally f flus attack young people and old people, mm -hmm. but the Spanish flu really had an effect on, um, those, uh, the, those that are in their twenties to their fifties, something along in there. Um, it had, um, there's a, a fascinating book that I read years ago about the Spanish flu. I can't, don't even ask me the name cause I can't tell you, I can't <laughs> tell you the title. But, um, you know, having worked for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the U.S. and specifically within the U.S. Public Health Service, I wasn't part of the Commission Corps, but most of the people I worked with were part of the Commission Corps, which is a um, an uh, uniform branch of the U.S. government, uh, uniform branch of the military. They look they dress like uh, the Navy. Uh, their uniforms look like those for the Navy. Um, and you read about what the U.S. Public Health Service was involved with and what they were doing. Then this, and this, the um, epidemic actually brought Johns Hopkins University into the forefront. They were mm -hmm. one of those that really were involved in um the epidemic and, and identifying people. Um, a lot of this was passed around because of the military. Uh, we were still in world war one and mm -hmm. they had soldiers that would get sick and they would ship them to different bases and stuff. And then overseas. And that was actually where a lot of it came a across. A, a lot of it was spread that way as well. Yeah. My grandfather. Oh, I'm not surprised that, oh, go ahead. I was going to say my grandfather fought in World War I, and he was in France. But mm. I don't think he ever, I know he didn't get the Spanish flu. So, but I can mm. see where that, that could, could happen. Yeah. Where you could bring it back. That's, it's fascinating. It really mm -hmm. is. It, yeah. it, when you think of, when you said what Sherlock Holmes age would be, and I know what my grandparents saw, they, they went from gas lights to electric lights uh, to no telephones to telephones uh, to no planes to, to jets. And even, well, my grandparents were long lived, so they even got to see computers. But um, that's amazing. That's mm -hmm. an amazing amount of time that those last hundred plus years. Right. Yeah. We've done great leaps. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And a lot of that I discuss in those little essays in the life and times of Sherlock Holmes. Because I it's about, fascinating, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. It is. It's, and, it's um, just fascinating. I have to say, they're not, I tried not to make them dry. They're right. Very, I tried to make little tidbits that people can, uh, lots of trivia. And I try to bring it sometimes all the way up to, uh, to present day, uh, bringing in research that's been done more recently. And things like that. Yeah. This is what we're talking about. Yeah. So we have just a few more minutes left. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. Let me put you on the spot. Oh, dear. Sure. Um, <laughs> what kind of advice would you give? Uh, there's a lot of wannabe authors out there, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, budding new authors just mm -hmm. trying to get started and running into all sorts of problems. What kind of, you know, advice and just a, a couple of minutes would you be able to give them or sure, sure. words of encouragement? Yeah. Uh, first of all, um, you know, I was there once. <laughs> I was, and like I said, I've got that one manuscript that's metaphorically <laughs> under my bed. Um, and um, I think the things that is uh, learning about your craft is, and there are lots of ways of doing it for myself. One of the things that was most important was taking creative writing courses through the junior college. Um, and you can take um, at, at that school, uh, at our community college, um, you could take them either 
uh, for credit or non-credit. Yep. And um, sometimes like the non-credit part would be full and I take it for credit. I mean, I took it, I can't tell you, uh, they, they offered short story, they offered novel. And uh, the only one I never took was uh, memoirs because I just wasn't <laughs> interested in writing a memoir, but they, <laughs> and they, they rotated. And so I, I went several years taking those classes. Probably a lot um, so of I would people can do that. On. Out, yeah. I'm sorry. A lot of people could um, do it online now. Yeah. You know, yeah. On the, the courses are yeah. probably offered. Yeah. Uh, what? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Before it was, you know, you would read and, and it, get, it got you over being scared of having other people listen to your work. Oh, because yeah. Because you had those people. Um, there also, I would encourage mm -hmm. people to look at um, local writers groups. Because mm -hmm. this is a, I, I did all of this. Okay. I did the, the courses I would do. I would go to local writers groups, romance writers of America was one. There's also mystery writers of America. Mm -hmm. um, there are others, uh, science fiction, I think is out there as well. Oh, yeah. And it's, um, and you have uh, speakers as well as uh, in meeting other writers because it, writing can be a very lonely thing and this is an opportunity for you to meet other people and nobody understands a writer better than another writer. Exactly. Um, That's true. And just keeping up with your craft uh, and learning your craft and uh, keep writing. Those yeah. are, that's what I would encourage people to do. Perfect. Start and then keep doing yeah. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Right. Don't right. just talk Don't about it up. or think yeah. about it. Start. Yeah. And the most important thing is uh, putting it down on paper. That's the other thing I learned. Um, you can't edit a blank page. <laughs> no, you uh, cannot. So uh, it doesn't have to be perfect. You just get it down and then you can edit and fix it. But the first thing is to get it down. There you go. And we all have to edit. Yeah, boy, that's for sure. Yeah. That's the fun part. Rewriting. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, here we are. Uh -huh. Thank you very much, Lisa. Oh, well, Glad thank you. Could join you. Us tonight. Like I said and... from the beginning, I really appreciate your podcast. And I thank you very much for letting me be a part of it. Well, and you're very welcome. We appreciate and... you being on the show. And I am sure that all of our listeners are sorry that they didn't get to ask you the questions that they wanted to, but I hope that we <laughs> did that for you. Right. And um, we're so glad that you were able to be on yeah. the show. It's been And wonderful. if they have any questions, they can always email me. Yep. I'd be glad sign to listen. Up for your newsletter be, and yeah. Yeah. learn uh -huh. more from you that way. Uh-huh. Sure. Okay. Well, I'm going to move you over to the side here while okay. we close out. So All right. let me see here if I can No, do you're that. going the wrong yep, way. Going the wrong way. <laughs> There, got you over there. Okay. <laughs> oh, I see what you meant. <laughs> okay. So, do you have any parting words? Nope, I can't think of any. No words of oh, wisdom? Oh, I do, I do. If you're going to read a book, would you please leave a review? Yes. And when you leave a review, would you please tell why you enjoyed the book and what you liked about the book so that people who have the same likes uh, will know, oh, this would be a good book for me. Very good. Um Next week, I uh, should have, uh, if we're still on schedule, which we hope to be, Orlando Sanchez will be on, uh, and it'll be live. And then the week after that, on the 24th, will be the, right before Thanksgiving, Adam Gaffin. And that's going to be pre-recorded. So one more live show before Thanksgiving. And I guess uh, until next time. That's all, folks. Thank you for joining us here on Meet the Author. Make sure you stay up to date with our show by clicking like, follow, and share. And you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, and more. See you next time on WLFE-DV.com. You've been listening to WLFE-DV.com, where our shows are your shows. <laughs>